So my starting point here are patterns that we find in other species, such as Zipf's law uh, for word frequencies, or equivalent of Zipf's law for word frequencies in, in dolphins, and other laws that have been studied and seem to indicate parallels between human language and uh, the behavior of other species. Uh, one of the goals of my talk is showing that the utility of information theory goes beyond just having an additional way of measuring things or, or, a new, or just another quantitative metric for doing something. Okay. Indeed, uh, we can think of information theory as providing us an ensemble of principles that can help us to understand how uh, evolution or either biological or cultural is constraining uh, systems in a way that makes them reproduce the same pattern in different species. Okay. The idea uh, is to think about elementary information theoretic principles and see how these principles interact with each other and how we can use one or two or three at the same time to explain a given uh, statistical pattern or certain, let's say, behavioral feature. Let us start with the, perhaps the most intuitive one, which is mutual information maximization. Okay? Imagine that we have words and meanings. This is an animal, animal behavior meeting, so as words, you could put, uh, you know, signal vocalizations, behaviors, and as meanings, you could put, uh, you put here, put here mental representations, but you could put here simpler things like behavioral reactions uh, to a certain vocalization, for instance. It can be simple. Okay. So you have two sets of things, a sort of word and a sort of meanings. Okay. Uh, so forgive me if I don't use the, let's say, the, the non-anthropocentric uh, terminology. Okay. We have signals or words and we have meanings that we can measure how externally correlated they are by means of mutual information, which is something that uh, Lawrence uh, presented before, but now I'm using a, an additional, an alternative definition of mutual information, which is equivalent, but it shows, uh, it indicates that mutual information is indeed a measure of how far you are from independence. So mutual information between words and meanings is telling you how far you are from independence, okay? Uh, between uh, words and meanings, okay? And this makes, this maximization principle makes some useful predictions. Uh, one is if you have the same number of words and the same, uh, you have the same number of words and meanings, then the prediction is that you're going to have a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, words and meanings, okay? If you have a different number, then it becomes less intuitive, but I, th I think I have to run a little bit. Okay. Uh, well, the idea behind this mutual information maximization is that uh, when we maximize it, we are promoting words as in identifiers or clues to meanings, and this reflects here needs. Uh, if you're thinking of, com uh, of communication as something involving a, a, a speaker and a hearer, uh, the more close you are to words being identifiers, the easier the job for the receiver. Okay. Uh, well, that's a general way of approaching it, but uh, we want to see if this works in general, uh, and, and in particular circumstances, such as the case of learning vocabulary. Okay? Imagine this, the following setup. A child hears a new word. The child has to guess the object the word refers to. It has, the, the child has two options. The word can be attached to an object that already has a word, or the word can be attached to a new object. And this has been tested many times uh, within a, let's say, psychological uh, experiment setup. And, and the funny thing is that on the different variations of this simple experiment, the child tends to take option two, uh, linking the new word to the new object. And indeed, this is something optimal according the, to the principle of mutual information maximization. This is important because we are going to see next how we can use mutual information to explain the reasons of the flow. So it's not, so we are using a principle that has 
many applications, not just zip law. Okay. Uh, okay, I want to run a little bit. Let's move to a, another principle, important principle, information theoretic principle of uh, behavior, which is compression. Okay. Um, Information theory provides us with a powerful concept, which is the mean code length uh, uh, of, uh, of a system. So you take, for instance, the words, and you have their probabilities, and you have their length. So the mean code length is measuring the, uh, exactly the mean length of those words. Okay? This measure can, in the standard information theory, is usually defined in, in bits as units, but you could generalize it and then uh, replace length in bits by length in letters or duration. The funny thing is that if you go to the real repertoires uh, for in human languages, but also in various uh, cases in animal behavior, it turns out that in many cases this, uh, this uh, mean code length, generalized mean code length, is significantly small. Okay. And interestingly, uh, for those who just cite uh, George King Lisif to criticize him, Ziff Law, um, uh, George King Lisif um, uh, didn't define exactly this equation with this exact formula, but he is, uh, defined the concept of minimum equation, which, if you read it, uh, can be considered uh, equivalent to this one. And, somehow a precursor of what information theory uh, was, uh, was developing by that time. OK, how can we justify it? What is the interest of this minimization? Okay. One is obvious. If you have to speak or you have to uh, vocalize, you, are, you need some energy to produce that um, in terms of gestures, or the muscles involved, the brain that has to coordinate all that. Uh, but it also has, let's say, uh, other kinds of uh, interests like reducing predation risk in a real, let's say, ecological environment. And quite, quite often it's important to uh, produce vocalization as short as possible to reduce the risk of being predated. The same for the predator. If you do it shorter, it's more, less likely that you, your prey is catch you. Uh, so, well, it makes a lot of sense. And indeed, uh, we can see how this manifests when looking at the relationship between the frequency of an element and its length. Uh, this is called the law of brevity. In human language, we know that uh, more frequent words, the, more, the higher the frequency of a word, uh, the shorter it is. This is valid for words. But it's also valid for vocalizations of formos and macaques, dolphin surface behavior. So the higher the frequency of the element of the repertoire, the shorter, uh, the smaller it is. Okay. Uh, and indeed, if you assume that the repertoire is finite, uh, you can predict that if you minimize this mean code length, generalized mean code length, you are going to have this uh, decreasing tendency. So increasing frequency is going to reduce the, the length or size of duration of, of the unit. So that's an example of a pattern that occurs across the species, and there is a theoretical explanation for this recurrence using information theory. Another principle, entropy minim minimization. Uh, uh, many of you know entropy. Uh, Lawrence made, made a great introduction. So you take the repertoire, you compute the entropy uh, over the probabilities of the elements of the repertoire. If you minimize it, that's a, a what the principle said, minimize this entropy, the prediction is that you're going to get only one word. That's a bit surprising because uh, we don't have in general systems with just one unit, okay? Uh, which makes it uh, a, a lot of interest. And once we know its justification, why this entropy minimization is necessary. Uh, many cognitive uh, scientists are working on the hypothesis that this entropy measures somehow the, the cost of a repertoire, the cost of a, let's say, a vocabulary, but also the cost of a morphological paradigm. And 
So when you ask a system to minimize its entropy, you are minimizing the, the energy that um, the system uh, is spending. Uh, we know that in human languages, we are, from, we are far from the worst case in terms of entropy. I, I told you the minimum is when there is only one word, one element that has non-zero probability. But the worst case is when all elements are equally likely. And we know, uh, thanks to Zipf's law, uh, that in humans we are far from that, for, being all, uh, for having all elements equally likely. And there is another interesting interpretation for the need uh, of minimize. Uh, there's an interesting way of justifying the minimization of entropy, which is in terms of the typical repertoire size. If um, formation theory has a nice concept, which is, well, one thing is the size of the repertoire. So imagine I have one uh, million uh, units in my repertoire. And another thing is the effective uh, repertoire size, the size of the typical set. How is this defined? Imagine that in this million uh, of units, you are using 99% of the time just one unit. Okay? The effective size of the repertoire is not one million. It's close to one. Okay? Uh, so minimizing entropy is a clever way of minimizing the size of the repertoire okay? using an information theoretic concept. And there might be further pressure for minimizing that entropy, which may come from the mink on length. Because in, in, uh, for a wide range of ways of uh, uh, coding information, <coughs> the entropy of a repertoire is a lower bound for the mean of length. So if you try to optimize your system, there is a barrier, which is this entropy of the repertoire. So it, uh, that suggests that maybe there is further pressure for minimizing this entropy due to the need of reducing this mean of length that has many implications in terms of the energy you expand, the prediction risk, and so on. Well, this is a very nice overview. and the, and. Here you have the most interesting part, which is that these uh, nice principles that you can justify indefinitely are in conflict. Because uh, if you want to maximize mutual information in your system, then you have an upper bound, which is entropy. And entropy is something you have to minimize. And there's also coming further pressure for reducing this mutual information from this mean of length. So communication uh, behavior is facing a very complicated problem, which is, for some reason, I want to develop elements that are as much informative as possible. But uh, for doing that, I have to pay a price. Okay. And well. Uh, how can we check that this conflict is real? Okay. Uh, on the one hand, this entropy minimization is taking me to, is, forced, is putting pressure to have just one element in the repertoire. But on the opposite side, this entropy mutual maximization of mutual information is putting pressure towards having one-to-one uh, -one mappings, almost equally likely uh, elements in, in the repertoire. And, Zipf's law is exactly this situation, this in-between situation between just one element uh, taking all the space and a diversification of elements for covering different meanings. Uh, and this can be formalized. So this conflict can be formalized. Imagine that you take the simplest approach. You combine these two pressures, the minimization. You define a function that you want to minimize that combines a term a term for um, maximizing this mutual information here, and a term for minimizing this entropy. Interestingly, if you minimize this function, you get that for a critical value of lambda, the parameter that controls the weight of these two forces, there is, uh, you find a distribution of uh, word frequencies that is consistent with Zipf's law. 
And with the small variations in this lambda above or below, you are going to get a distribution that uh, differs radically from Zipf's law. Okay. okay, that's funny. It suggests that any face uh, that human language could be operating in in a sort of in the vicinity of a phase transition. That's cool from a physical point of view. But then Ramon, uh, if the model requires this fine tuning of lambda, uh, why does it flow surface so frequently? Well, this is a challenge not only for this modeling, but it's also a challenge for uh, other models of the flow, even if you don't think about it. So I have shown a, sophisticated, a rather sophisticated way of uh, explaining the emergence of the flow in a nat natural communication system. But we know that there are simpler ways of reproducing Zipf's law. One among the most famous is Simon's model. So imagine that with probability alpha, you add an existing word, you are producing a text, you add a new word with a certain probability, and with one minus that probability, you choose one of the words that you have already produced at random and put it as the next word. Okay? This is going to give you Zipf's law. It's an extremely simple model. As um, some people call, uh, uh, would put it, it's an example of low mechanistic sophistication behind uh, Ziff's law. Uh, but so we are a scientist, and when we have to choose for the, a certain phenomenon a more complicated explanation and a simple explanation, we tend to favor through oak and brace or the simple one. Should we buy Simon's model instead of? the nice information theoretic approach I presented before. Well, let's think about uh, the si Simon's model uh, with more care, okay? Well, if it's true that Zipf's law uh, might be reflecting a simple mechanism such as Simon's model, one should, uh, and as Zipf's law is occurring in a wide range of situations in animal uh, uh, behavior, well, we, we would expect that the mechanism behind Zipf's law is a robust one, okay? Well, let, let's play a little bit with the uh, rules of the model. So imagine that instead of choosing an old word of, of the sequence with a probability proportional to the frequency of that word in the past, we choose it with that frequency to some exponent gamma. This is what I'm review here is the research by Fan Chung and colleagues. <coughs> okay, so we are going to test how sensitive is the rule, the basic rule of the system to a, a generalization. Funny thing is that if gamma is greater than one, then a single word dominates. That's not the flaw. If gamma is smaller than one, you get an exponential distribution of uh, word frequency. And exactly when gamma is equal to 1, you get a power law. Okay? Uh, so, this means that simple models are not as robust as one may a priori think. So, they are indeed not so simple as we think. And the same, a similar uh, idea applies to a famous random typing uh, model. Uh, but here, uh, there is a a special characteristic, uh, or a special, let's say, comment to make, which is maybe, I, I suppose everybody knows of that, or many of you know that uh, some researchers have claimed that if you just type at random uh, on a keyboard and you have letters and, and the space, the space, you hit those keys at random, and you are going to have a sequence of characters separated by spaces if you, according to uh, certain researchers, that um, if you um, make the, the statistics of that pseudo text, you recover it. Well. But indeed, you don't recover it so easily as it has been claimed. Yeah. The, the argument, uh, you don't need to be a hard mathematician to check that, just simulate it uh, with the same conditions that uh, people used in the, for defending the validity of, of this random typing model. So choose. Uh, define a probability of hitting the space and take all letters being equally likely. And you will see how hard it is to reproduce the actual 
uh, shape of Zipf's law okay? in, in languages. So simple models don't seem to work. Uh, Ramon, you are selling a sophisticated information theoretic approach. But you, you combine uh, two things in a le le rather arbitrary way. So you have mutual information maximization and minimization of entropy. You combine them linearly. Why linearly? Okay. Well, let us think about a model selection problem. Many of you know a cake information criterion, which is the uh, minus log likelihood times uh, the number of parameters with a constant here <coughs> to introduce corrections of some sort, for instance, for finite. Uh, um, if you have a, a sample of a small size, you have to introduce a correction. And there are different ways of doing. That's, it. That's just one of example based on like information criterion. You, we could make the same similar arguments with Bayesian and information criterion, for instance. Okay. The funny thing is that this log likelihood here is equivalent to a curva uh, Leibler divergence between an empirical distribution and a model distribution. So when we do a model uh, selection with a gate information criterion, we are at minimizing the divergence of the empirical. Uh, data uh, from the theoretical model, and we introduce a, a times uh, a penalty for the number of parameters the model is uh, uh, is using. So it's a way of weighting the quality of the fit of a theoretical model uh, in combination with the parsimony of the model. Okay. Well, what I'm going to argue next is that we have a similar thing. Uh, <coughs> when we are minimizing this omega function of communication. Okay. Because with a simple transformation, this minimization of omega is equivalent to minimizing this function here where we have just one uh, parameter here controlling the weight of mutual information maximization and uh, entropy minim uh, minimization. And indeed, indeed, this mutual information is a curva clever diversions from randomness. Okay. This is what you have here. Essentially, minimizing this omega function, we are performing a sort of agnostic model selection where I don't tell you the model. I just want the model to diverge from randomness. But you are going to pay a penalty for parsimony, the energy that you are using for behaving, for communicating, and so on. So. It's not surprising that this law emerges in communication, in human language, in dolphins, and maybe other species that we have not investigated yet. Because Zipf's law kind, might be emerging from the simple fact that the system has to maximize the mutual information, escape from randomness at a reasonable cost. So uh, through this information theoretic approach, we have a way of thinking in abstract terms that are valid not only for human language, are valid for animal behavior, and are also valid for other information uh, transfer systems or exchange systems such as uh, DNAs. Um, and it, that opens uh, how, how much um, I'm, okay. And that opens very interesting questions, which is, OK, uh, we, ha we are solving a complex problem. We are optimizing according to different principles, but uh, would there be cases where just one principle is winning? So that's a, uh, So it's not only the, uh, a challenge for you to see if other systems show this law, uh, but would there be systems where one of those principles, maximum uh, mutual information or minimum entropy, just have, are the winners, and then you get a, some, something that is uh, far for the law, but for, for um, far from Zipf's law. So we, the 
There are two challenges, understanding how this conflict manifests, but also the extreme cases where just one principle would be operating. Um, well, thank you for your attention.